Hello friends, this is Self-Critical Automaton, your vague sense of existential malaise at a world that has become sickened. And today it's time for episode 4 of my Dishonored Let's Play. Uh, one thing I want to mention before we start is I just want to give a shout out to my friend Alison. Thank you so much for all of the technical support help you've given me with all of my computer problems over the years. I would not be doing Let's Plays without your help. Uh, you know, you've been helping me out so much all the way back to like 2015 when I first started making these before all my long, long... Um, hiatuses. And yeah, just thank you so much. That's all. Let's dump, uh, jump in. So I cut this in a really weird place because of timing working out weirdly. Uh, once again, I've, I've stopped right before a load zone, so let's dive right into the only neatly made bed in this entire setting. I love to wake up in the morning to the sound of gentle rain outside my windows and my door having disappeared. It's not peculiar at all. That happens to me every morning. This, though, this is rarer. This is less common. So this is the void, which is, um, within the setting, a kind of an astral plane, which exists outside of time and space and is this mysterious other realm that exerts, exerts a strange and corrupting, mysterious, mystical influence on the world. Hello, Corvo. Your life has taken a turn, has it not? The Empress is dead, her precious daughter Emily is lost somewhere in the city, and you will play a pivotal role in the days to come. For this I have chosen you, and drawn you into the void. I am the outsider, and this is my mark. There are forces in the world and beyond the world, great forces that we call magic. And now, these forces will serve your will. Use this newfound power, my gift to you. Come find me. It's a long-running mystery in the fan community what the Outsider's name is, but he does tell you right here, I am the Outsider, and this is Mark. Um, so yeah, one thing I haven't mentioned is that this game essentially turns itself into Fast Thief by giving you the ability to cast various spells. Uh, the most iconic of which is, of course, Blink, which lets you teleport a short distance in front of you. So, as a place outside of time, a dream world bereft of logic, uh, a realm of thought and mystery, when Corvo comes here, he sees little scenes of the past and the future, and the present. Fallen letter, you cannot save her. Which obviously reflects his mental state. So... <clears throat> I have a variety of thoughts about both the Void in general and the Outsider. Corvo, I am very sad. They say you are dead like mother, but I'm going to put this note in a bottle and throw it in the river because I do not believe them. Living here is very strange. I do not like it, so please come for me if you can. And this is, I think, her fir the first of her drawings that we see, of which we will see various more instances as we go through the game. Um, also, shout out to Void Whale, which is one of the most beloved characters, according to the fan community. Everyone loves the Void Whale, he's everybody's buddy. But yeah, so, it's interesting to see these having played the game, because you recognise these locations, and you know that Corvo is actually seeing, well, possibly, true events. This is not just uh, a dreamscape. It is a prophetic dream that reflects reality in some sense. After all, here's Hiram Burrows being angry about a table, which is, as we know, something he does a lot. This vignette is interesting because it was actually in the game's marketing, um, and a lot of people were then surprised when this event never occurs during the game. Um, except for here, where it's just a, a static thing showing you some, something that's happening somewhere in the world, but there's not actually a um, an actual event in the plot or that you can see in-game anywhere. So the Void and the Outsider are generally presented as this kind of like mysterious influence, a kind of a very sort of Victorian spiritualist, almost cosmic horror kind of a sort of well, okay, hang on. In the days that follow, your trials will be great, Corvo. Seek the ancient runes bearing my mark in the lonely places of your world, and at shrines raised in my name. 
These runes will grant you powers beyond those of other men. To help you find these runes, I give you this. The heart of a living thing, molded by my hands. With this heart, you will hear many secrets, and it will guide you toward my runes, no matter how they may be hidden. Listen to the heart now, and find another room. So, uh, yeah, every time I get interrupted I forget what I was talking about, which makes it very inconvenient that this particular chapter has a man who can teleport and just appear in front of me whenever he likes. So, yeah, um, the thing about the way this setting works is that it's got this very kind of subtle influence where it's kind of, hmm, did some did something happen due to the influence of the void, or did something just be lucky in a certain way? But um, <clears throat> it's it's kind of um, you know it's this idea of like the dark whispers in the night, the creeping influence, the shadows at the corner of your vision. You know, the voice of the outsider is the voice of the voice of lunacy in the in the ear of a madman, you know, it's that kind of very Victorian view of a kind of like existential corrupting influence. But it is also just a natural part of the world, you know, whether people believe in it or not. And um, the outsider is this kind of folkloric figure within that. But to most people, he is just the shadow in the corner of your eye, you know, the whispers in the night. Corvo has a fundamentally different relationship to this individual than almost anyone else in the world, because to Corvo, he's just some guy. He's just a floating twink who shows up to do exposition at you <laughs> and give you magic powers for no reason. Um, and I think that the difference between the way these characters and this, you know, law of reality are seen within the setting, as compared to how it's presented to Corvo and thus the player, has been a major influence on the way that, like, the fan community sees the the nature of this world and in ways that I don't particularly hold with I will talk about as we go on I'm not gonna buy any new spells right now how you use what I have given you falls upon you as it has to the others before you. And now I return you to your world, but know that I will be watching with great interest. The way that books and characters and, you know, side events that you see, and just the texture of the world, talk about the void and about the outsider, is so utterly different to the way that, that Corvo experiences him. Um, and I think that's kind of the one of the weird fundamental dissonances in the game. Oh hey, my door's back. That's uh, that's nice. Always good to know that your door will always uh, support you and follow you and trust you in everything you do. I guess you could say it adores you. If you like, but he won't use it. Why? He can't sleep in regular beds anymore, or that's what he says. Says he was in the navy too long. Can you believe it? Oh. That pile of wood out there. It's a hobble he built from an old rowboat. Where does Admiral Havelock find these people, I wonder? So, yeah, uh, he gave us the heart, which has two uses. One is that it highlights the location of any, any runes or bone charms in the area. The other is that it tells you secrets about people and places. The other servants don't like her. Work is never done for the lowly servant. And a fairly large... I think that if you don't use the heart at all, there's still a lot of good characterization in the game, but it does a lot of heavy lifting. Somewhere in the basements below, Hound kills Hound, and money changes hands. She hides her hands. They are raw and scarred from the washing. She's one of the few characters I actually like from the Hound Pits. Let's see what the heart has to say about um, inveterate bootlicker and general hanger on Wallace. He spies on his neighbors. I mean, I did not need a magic heart to tell me that. He's just that type of person. Sorry, Cecilia. I'm in your way. So, uh, let's go grab that rune while I ramble about stuff. Basically, I much prefer this interpretation of the world as being this kind of, like, a very realistic kind of... Did magic happen, or is it just coincidence, kind of very, very subtle kind of low magic. 
which fits the way that people talk about magic in this world. Because um, a lot of people tend to forget that while the outsider is one of the most powerful and, like, well-known ways of influencing the world through magic, people make shrines to the out out outsider, cultists worship him in the hope of gaining some of these powers, that's not the only way to draw power from the void. The power itself comes from the void, and the outsider is... He is a god in the void, he is not the god of the void. Because there are constantly these hints about older and ancient folkloric methods of drawing power. The bone charms themselves have nothing to do with the outsider. Um, they are just, you know, a traditional method of securing some tiny scrap of, of mystical power from an external world. There are implications that there are these rituals that exist to draw power from the void in their own way without needing to um, rely on the outsider, a fickle god that most people don't believe in and very few people ever actually see. Does part of the soul live in the heart? If the heart keeps beating, does that mean that the spirit is never released into oblivion? I can keep a heart beating forever with electricity, but what does that mean for any essence trapped within? It'd be easier if I created processes in waking hours. I am uneasy pursuing avenues that emanate from my dreaming mind. So, Piero implies in this audio message that he is visited by the outsider at night, because it is this kind of, like, strange dreams, whispering influence. This reinforces the thing I've just been saying. That the void and the outsider are both this kind of, like, creeping, strange influence from the beyond. Which is kind of, it matches a lot of um, Victorian spirituality, the spirituality of the seance, that kind of um, mysticism. Except, you know, for a handful of people, he is just a god that makes you a wizard. Each and every night, the black eyed outsider visits upon Theo's dreams. So yeah, um, we'll read books when we come back to this area the next time. I feel like two whole ass episodes is way too long to spend exploring uh, just the Hound Pits pub. I'm not going to read this whole thing because it's not that interesting, but basically this is a reference to Portal. Piero has built this door with the, uh, the swirl icon and he talks about how it could be a, a portal doorway. I always took this as being kind of a nice... Um, like, it's not literally he's trying to make a teleporter, it's a, a representation, it's a piece of art, basically. It's a representation of his ideas about where his ideas come from and where his inspiration comes from. But rereading that note when I played through this uh, this chapter earlier, um, no, he is straight up trying to build a teleporter and that's that's how he started doing it. So if I talk to Sam, he'll tell me to go talk to Priero. I hope you're well rested. Oh, hang on. Right, of course, I don't actually have my mission yet. That's what happens when you um, record an entire episode only to discover that your recording software broke halfway through and um, you need to re-record the entire thing, which is frustrating, but hey, can I have a job? Well, let's get down to it. First off, I know that assassination is dark business, but sometimes good men have to do bad things to make the world right. Our purpose is clear. We want to restore Her Majesty's line by finding and putting Emily Caldwin on the throne. To those ends, we'll hide, act in shadow, take them apart, piece by piece. Tonight, High Overseer Campbell dies by your hand. It won't be easy. He's protected by his overseers, an army of religious zealots. But if anyone can do it, you can. Your exploits are legendary. Campbell carries a private journal. Once you've eliminated him, get the journal, because we think it contains Emily's location. Recovering her is obviously critical, assuming she's alive. That's the gist of it. Remember our cause and strike true. We're counting on you. Another thing. Campbell is holding a former overseer by the name of Martin. He's one of us, and if you manage to find him, give him whatever help you can. He's a master strategist, and he got caught working for our cause. It'd be good to have him back here at the Hound Pits. I'm not trying to read the book, I'm trying to steal his booze. Uh, the Exquisite Tallboy. 
excerpt from a letter of public concern from anonymous authors. What you've read here is the truth, regardless of what you will hear from the authorities who rule over us. It is not a matter of coincidence that the former royal spymaster is the one who stepped in when the elate empress fell. We, who will remain na nameless, believe that these events are interconnected. The signs of oppression are all around us. Sokolov designs, originally intended to provide light and warmth in our homes, have been turned against us as a means of inspiring fear and controlling our movements. Where did this plague originate? Some say it was imported. A wild theory? Perhaps. One of our members has risked her life to obtain an internal report from the government, which we will be printing and sharing soon, called The Exquisite Tallboy, extolling the virtues of this newest member of the City Watch. To those in the streets below, these virtues are horrors, spread by stilted thugs who rain down fire on the sick and the poor. To these eyes, the Tallboy is another government bully, armed with incendiary devices thickly armoured and standing high overhead, looking down on the common people of the city. We now know that the tall boys are heavily drugged, imbibing a substance that renders them resistant to pain, but also dulls whatever empathy they might possess. Exquisite, we think not. Copy these words and share them with your neighbours, and remember, when the tides are lowest, the truth will be revealed. So, this is kind of written to appear like, you know, paranoiac rambling, but it's actually completely true. And one of the things that this game talks about, one of the themes this game actually has, is that of, like, the struggle of the common people against their rulers. The eternal struggle the eternal struggle of finding coins in the gutter i literally said previously like the reason why you always end a chapter with a ton of coins missing is because they are literally everywhere and hard to spot uh but yeah so the struggle of um you know people to su oops to survive against you know in a system which is fundamentally unfair and exploitational corvo hello i'm callista I work here for Admiral Havelock. I'm sorry to intrude on your business, but this is important. I suspect you're going to kill the High Overseer. That wretched man. There's really no reason for you to listen to me. But my uncle, Jeff Kernow, still serves as captain in the City Watch. But he's a good man, and my only family. The chatter in servant circles is that Campbell just took delivery of an exotic poison. And I think I know why. My uncle's not corruptible like the rest of them. Campbell is going to poison my uncle. Do you think you could protect him? You used to do that, right? Before you had your current profession. Before you became an assassin. Weird side note, Callista is actually played by Lena Headey. This game has a weirdly star-studded cast. I think Susan Sarandon is in it as well. Uh, ignore the sword, I just have to have it out when I'm using my magic uh, magic artifact that you also can't see. She, she is Callista Kerr now. She, she has learned, learned to defend herself in this treacherous city. city. Such, Such laughter. And they are singing the old songs, linking arms. But that was from a happier time. What else does it say about Pierre? Beals are made here. Oh, okay. Sometimes under the influence of wine. And sometimes... The is the point of a knife. After it's told you everything it wants to tell you about a particular person, it just starts telling you about the area you're in, which is usually less interesting and it starts to repeat itself. Um, so I need to talk to Pierre before we leave, even though he doesn't actually what have anything I, I want to buy. Or, well, that I can afford to buy that I want to buy. Rune is very worth picking up. The rest of these we'll probably have plenty of just from playing through the level. We might need rewire tools, we'll probably not be short on remedy, we'll probably not be short on sleep bolts, and we won't need bolts, bullets, spring racers, or grenades, because, well, we're trying not to kill people. And if we are going to kill people, it should be subtler than a grenade. I say, looking forwards to the bonus episode, uh, high chaos playthrough that I will be doing simultaneously. I don't think I've mentioned this, actually, but at the end of each chapter I'm going to have a, uh, I'm going to post a, a quick playthrough of each chapter in high chaos mode. So, um, I think I'm going to end this episode here. Uh, it's a bit of a short one, but I've tended to run over previously, so I'm sure nobody will mind. This should be the last we see of the Hound Pits for a while. Every time we visit next, well, the next time and from then on that we visit, it should be a bit faster. There's not going to be two whole episodes devoted to every interlude, it's just that I wanted to show off all of the locations, and, you know, talking to the outsider takes a while. Because, you know, whenever you're visiting your god, it's like, ah, oh, jeez, this is so long. When you want to set out. Just give the word. So, next episode, we will set off into the city and begin doing the actual work of assassination. Although, I'm ready when you are, sir. I will point out to Callista that I'm just, I'm actually not an assassin yet. I haven't assassinated anyone. I have killed some people, but not like, those were murders, you know, not assassinations. There is a difference. 
Anyway, um, service. cool. Can I talk? Or are you... I like Sam, but he can be very, very wordy. Anyway, so that's all from me for today. Actually, I, before I go, I really want to talk about the quality of light. Um, there is a really good quality of light in this game, and they make sure to adjust it to the time of day. It is a beautiful morning. The colour palette of the area is changed by the quality of the light. The way the water feels changes as well as we go through the day and we see these places at different times of day and night. It is a really nice touch that they put that much care and attention into every single part of this game. Okay, that actually will be all from me now. Uh, I'll catch you later. Bye! If you like this, you can also follow me on Twitter for updates, stream announcements and one-tweet micro-reviews, or why not donate to me via Patreon or Ko-fi or just share my work. Thank you so much for watching.